Hello, I'm Dr. James Fitzgerald, Residency Program Director at MedStar Washington Hospital Center in Washington, D.C. I will be presenting this lecture on ischemic colitis. I have no disclosures. By the end of this module, listeners should be able to discuss the vasculature of the colon, including the watershed regions, identify the signs and symptoms of ischemic colitis, understand the diagnostic tools used to evaluate ischemic colitis, and outline the medical and surgical interventions used to treat ischemic colitis. Ischemic colitis occurs because of injury to the colon due to reduced blood flow. Most physicians associate ischemic colitis with elderly patients who have underlying cardiovascular comorbidities. However, ischemic colitis can also present in younger patients with different risk factors. This varied patient population and variable risk factors make diagnosing ischemic colitis a challenge. Though the majority of patients with ischemic colitis can be managed medically, roughly 20% require surgery. Ischemic colitis often presents in older patients with a history of atherosclerotic disease. These patients often present with acute onset of crampy abdominal pain and typically have a bloody bowel movement within 24 hours. In addition, lab results will show leukocytosis. The pathophysiology of ischemic colitis is typically an acute self-limited decrease in blood flow rather than an embolic event or specific vascular lesion. Angiography, if abnormal, will show narrowing of the small vessels and tortuosity of the long colonic arteries. The vasculature of the colon is thought to play an important role in the development of ischemic colitis as an episode of hypoperfusion is thought to precede the development of ischemic colitis. The superior mesenteric artery supplies blood to the gastrointestinal tract from the duodenum to the mid-transverse colon. The inferior mesenteric artery supplies blood from the mid-transverse colon to the superior aspect of the rectum. The internal iliac arteries communicate with the inferior mesenteric artery via the superior and middle hemorrhoidal arteries. In addition to this blood supply, there is also collateral blood flow for the colon. There is collateral flow through the mesenteric branches from the marginal artery of Drummond and the meandering mesenteric artery, also known as the arc of Riolan. The marginal artery runs parallel to the colon so that it can provide branches of the vasa recta. The marginal artery also runs along the splenic flexure, however it is underdeveloped or absent in 5% of the population. Ischemic colitis often occurs after an injury to the watershed region of the colon, which are the splenic flexure and sigmoid colon. I thank Dr. Gordon for permission to use this anatomic illustration. In this view, the transverse colon has been tented up so that the underlying vasculature can be seen. The collateral flow through the mesenteric branches are provided via the marginal artery of Drummond and the meandering mesenteric artery, also known as the arc of Riolan. The marginal artery runs parallel to the colon in order to give branches of the vasa recta. The marginal artery runs along the splenic flexure, but is absent or underdeveloped in 5% of the population. Injury to the colon is believed to typically occur in watershed areas of the splenic flexure, Griffith's point, and the sigmoid colon, Suddick's point. The pathophysiology of ischemic colitis is more often an acute self-limited decrease in blood flow rather than a specific vascular lesion or embolic event. Angiography, when abnormal, shows narrowing of the small vessels and tortuosity of the long colonic arteries. As can be seen by this slide, there are numerous risk factors for developing ischemic colitis. Of those listed, the majority are associated with older age and the comorbidities that often affect our elderly patients. However, constipation, coagulopathy, illicit and prescription drug use, and extreme exertion are risk factors specifically associated with young adults. I will now discuss several of these risk factors in more depth. Though ischemic colitis is a rare complication of aortic aneurysm repair, it is something that we, as physicians, need to be aware of.
A study looked at roughly 90,000 patients who underwent abdominal aortic aneurysm repair over a two-year period. This study found that the overall incidence of ischemic colitis in this patient population was 2.2%. Not surprisingly, ischemic colitis was more likely to develop after a repair of a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm with an incidence of 8.9% as compared to those who had repair done electively. Another interesting finding from this study is that patients who underwent an endovascular repair had a lower incidence, 0.5%, as compared to those who underwent open repair, 1.9%. Regardless of the surgical approach, ischemic colitis was associated with an increased morbidity and a two to four fold increase in mortality. Due to this fact, several other papers have suggested that patients who underwent repair for a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm should have routine endoscopic exams. This does seem to detect ischemic injury, but its ability to affect mortality has not been shown as of yet. Multiple studies have examined the risk factors for developing ischemic colitis in younger patients, and one of the risk factors that has been demonstrated in many studies is constipation. A retrospective review compared clinical features of patients less than 45 years of age to those over the age of 70. This study found that constipation prior to the development of symptoms of ischemic colitis was more frequent in the younger patient population. Another study looked at patients ranging from 22 years old to 98 years old and found that constipation was commonly associated with ischemic colitis in both patient populations. Another study determined that the relative risk for ischemic colitis was 2.78 times higher for patients with constipation. Though the exact mechanism has not been discovered, it is theorized that the increased intraluminal pressure causes decreased blood flow to the mucosa and thus predisposes these patients to ischemic attacks. In addition, coagulopathy may predispose patients to ischemic colitis. A study of 18 patients found that five of those patients, 28%, were positive for one or more clotting abnormalities as compared to the prevalence in the general population, which is 8.4%. There have been many studies showing that illicit drug use can cause ischemic colitis in otherwise healthy patients. A retrospective study showed that patients with documented cocaine-associated enterocolitis developed symptoms within three days of using cocaine. This study also demonstrated that the inflammatory changes often occurred on the right side. These patients responded well to non-operative management, but for those needing surgery, it was found that a laparotomy was associated with a 50% mortality rate. A case-controlled study conducted over a nine-year period compared 19 patients with cocaine-associated ischemic colitis to 78 patients with ischemic colitis not associated with cocaine use. This study found that patients with cocaine-associated ischemic colitis were younger and had significantly higher mortality rates compared to the other group, 26% versus 7.7%. Methamphetamines are also associated with ischemic colitis, and it is thought to be due to the fact that these drugs cause vasoconstriction that can lead to end organ damage. In addition to illicit drugs associated with ischemic colitis, there are numerous prescription drugs that are associated with it as well. The list includes digoxin, aspirin, clozapine, an antipsychotic, phenobarbital, oral contraceptives, and nasodecongestions. The mechanism by which they cause ischemic colitis is not fully understood. As stated in the slide, many endurance athletes test positive for fecal occult blood. Though there are numerous causes for testing positive, there are many studies reporting the development of ischemic colitis in high endurance athletes. It is recommended that these athletes hydrate adequately, avoid non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications, caffeine, alcohol, and high energy or hypertonic foods and drinks during their training. Due to the vague nature of symptoms associated with ischemic colitis, it is important for physicians to have a high index of suspicion. Physicians must ask about comorbidities such as cardiovascular disease and diabetes.
They must also ask about current medications and illicit drug use, as these may predispose patients to ischemic colitis. In addition to obtaining a thorough history, a physical examination must be done. If patients present with peritonitis and sepsis, they must be aggressively resuscitated and taken to the operating room. For patients with more equivocal physical exam findings, further testing may be required. I will now elaborate on further tests and studies used to help confirm the diagnosis of ischemic colitis. Various laboratory studies can be utilized to help diagnose ischemic colitis. Complete blood counts and complete metabolic panels as well as liver function studies may aid in the diagnosis. Other labs that are useful include lactate, lactate dehydrogenase, creatinine kinase, and amylase. Though these markers are not specific to ischemic colitis, if they are elevated, it suggests that there is inadequate perfusion or nonspecific tissue injury. Other studies that should be considered include stool studies to look for Salmonella, Shigella, Campylobacter, E. coli, and C. difficile colitis. In addition to these bacterial infections, parasitic infections should remain on the differential. Viruses such as CMV, viruses such as CMV may also present similarly with vague symptoms of abdominal pain and should therefore be considered in the differential as well. In addition to laboratory studies, imaging studies should be utilized in determining the diagnosis. In the early stages of ischemic colitis, the abdominal x-rays will show a nonspecific gas pattern or ileus. As the disease progresses, thumbprinting may be seen on x-ray. Thumbprinting occurs due to submucosal hemorrhage or edema that causes focal mural thickening. If the disease continues to progress, perforation and pneumatosis can occur and be seen on x-ray. CT scans are unlikely to be abnormal in the early stages of ischemic colitis, but they can be useful in ruling out other causes of abdominal pain. As ischemic colitis progresses, segmental thickening of the colon or pericolonic stranding may be seen on CT as shown in the following two images. However, these findings are not considered specific to ischemic colitis as they are seen in inflammatory bowel disease or infections. Again, if ischemic colitis continues to progress, pneumatosis or portal venous gas may be seen on CT scan, suggesting bowel infarction. Though X-ray and CT scans are the most common imaging studies used for ischemic colitis, a prospective study examined the use of serial abdominal MRI exams along with colonoscopy and CT scans in patients with documented ischemic colitis. Though direct comparison among the various imaging techniques were difficult due to the timing, the study suggested that MRI may be a suitable substitute to invasive studies used to diagnose and follow patients with ischemic colitis. In addition to these imaging studies, Technetium-99 nuclear medicine studies have been examined in a small number of patients but are currently not considered useful in the diagnosis of ischemic colitis. The following images demonstrate coronal sections of the abdomen showing thickening of the splenic flexure, descending colon, and proximal sigmoid colon in a patient with ischemic colitis. Colonoscopy is the diagnostic test of choice to evaluate the degree of ischemia in patients without peritoneal signs. Colonoscopy is the most sensitive and specific test for the diagnosis of ischemic colitis because it is able to detect mucosal changes via direct visualization. Findings that are consistent with ischemic colitis seen on colonoscopy include petechial hemorrhage, edematous and fragile mucosa, mucosal bleeding, segmental erythema, scattered erosions, and longitudinal ulcerations. Findings that are suggestive of more severe ischemia include loss of hostral markings, cyanosis, and gangrene. Biopsies can be useful to rule out other diseases, but the findings associated with ischemic colitis are often nonspecific. Histology often reveals erosion, granulation tissue hyperplasia, 
gland atrophy, lamina propria hemorrhage, and macrophages with hemosiderin pigmentation in the submucosa. This image shows mucosal bleeding, erythema, and intraluminal blood seen in mild ischemic colitis. This image demonstrates ulceration, scattered erosions, and intraluminal clot observed in a patient with severe ischemic colitis. This image shows gangrenous mucosa in a patient with severe ischemic colitis. This image demonstrates a transition point distally to the normal mucosa in a patient with ischemic colitis. The following two slides show histologic changes from a biopsy of a patient with ischemic colitis. The images demonstrate ulceration with fibrinous exudate, vascular congestion, and hemorrhage with acute inflammation and granulation tissue reaction. Patients diagnosed with ischemic colitis should be aggressively resuscitated and treated with broad-spectrum IV antibiotics. Patients who are hemodynamically stable and do not have peritonitis should undergo a colonoscopy as the physical exam findings, in addition to the appearance of the colonic mucosa, will dictate treatment. Medical management includes bowel rest, intravenous fluids, and antibiotics as previously mentioned. Nasal gastric tubes may be used in patients with distension or ileus. In addition, physicians should avoid vasoconstrictive medications. In conjunction with these measures, the patient's mental status, abdominal pain, and urine output should be closely monitored to assess for signs of adequate end organ perfusion. Patients who present with peritonitis or non-viable bowel on endoscopic examination should have immediate operative intervention. All non-viable bowel must be resected, and a second look operation may be needed to assess areas of questionable perfusion. Whether or not to perform an anastomosis in these patients is determined by the immediate condition of the patient, as well as their comorbidities and nutritional status. After the ischemic episode resolves, some patients may develop strictures in the colon. These should be examined via colonoscopy with biopsy to rule out malignancy or other pathology. The severity of the strictures will vary, but some patients may require dilation or surgical resection for severe symptoms. Most patients with ischemic colitis are managed medically. However, morbidity and mortality remain high for patients needing surgery. A meta-analysis showed that the mortality rate for patients managed medically was 6.2%, while for those who had surgery, the mortality rate was 39.3%. In a retrospective study demonstrating similar findings, it was shown that preoperative hypotension was a significant risk factor for mortality. Long-term outcomes for these patients are typically favorable. Recurrence rates for patients at one and five years are 2.9 and 9.7% respectively. Five-year survival was found to be 69%, However, most of the patients died from other causes not associated with ischemic colitis. Long-term complications include stricture in the affected segment. In conclusion, the vague presentation and nonspecific lab tests and radiographic results make diagnosing ischemic colitis difficult. However, physicians need to have a high index of suspicion as treatment for ischemic colitis needs to happen quickly.
Recognizing risk factors in younger patients is essential to institute timely care. The majority of the patients respond to medical management. Surgery, when required, is associated with a high morbidity and mortality rate. I'd like to thank the MedStar Colorectal Surgery Program, as well as a few individuals who contributed content for this presentation. Doctors Luis Hernandez and Anjali Kumar, Ann Trenton, Allison Estep, Sister Teresa Kozlovsky, and Dr. David Beck. Thank you for your attention.